Yeah, it's all good. Good. Good evening, everybody. Um, so I get to kick off, and uh, like Bill just said in the introduction, uh, we consider uh, femoral nailing kind of the gold standard for treatment of femoral fractures. Uh, surprisingly, 30 years ago, that wasn't the case. Uh, so what I'm going to try to do in, in the next few minutes is kind of give you a kind of a, a step forward in time from the 1970s to where we are now uh, of really the debate and the, the issues that have driven uh, IM nail development. So, fine. Advance the slide here. So uh, just for my intellectual disclosures and, and property, I have intellectual uh, property contracts with the tri uh, on this Trigen and uh, RT systems in the past and went to the Camel Clinic. My institution is the Presley Trauma Center. Uh, that's where I am now. The, the building you see on the left is demolished, but that's where we started doing closed nailing in 1977. And that corresponded when we got our first uh, C-arm in Memphis. Uh, so we're going to be talking about shaft fractures today. And so I've got to you know, re restrict my comments away from the 31 uh, A's and the 33's. And Tracy may get into some of the 33's a little bit. Uh, surprisingly uh, to none of y'all is that this is primarily the main indication in the United States and pretty much around the world from a half seal to half seal fracture instability. It's a, a major constituent of polytrauma resuscitation. Uh, we use it for open fractures now. Uh, it supports the soft tissues, allows us to treat the soft tissue wound better. We obviously use it for non-unions and malunions uh, and pathologic fractures. Um, there are times when you shouldn't use a nail, and this is when I don't use them. If the major canal in the patient is less than six millimeters, uh, you would have to take away so much bone uh, to get an IM nail in that I usually don't think of a reamed interlocking nailing for this patient. Uh, grossly contaminated fractures, you're not going to nail initially. Uh, you want to get the wound stabilized, get the wound uh, cleaned up, uh, and, and really use uh, damage control orthopedics for these. Uh, an under-resuscitated polytrauma patient, this is uh, kind of thing that we still bites us every now and then, that we have a patient who comes in and it's like, oh, we got to get the femur nailed, but you start looking at them, the lactate's high, and they really haven't got enough blood. They're really not stable. Uh, and this is a real danger to try to nail this kind of patient. And then uh, fractures that are past the extent of the biomechanical stability of the nail itself. So those are when I don't do them. Uh, you hear a lot of debate now about when to use um, external fixation for acute management. Um, Dr. Pappy has written a lot about this, and it's still kind of a, an issue. It's primarily for the under-resuscitated uh, patients or the patients that are uh, really seriously injured uh, that will consider this, uh, and then also hand wounds. But it's not the standard for the majority of patients we, we treat. Um, here's the two most important things that we've learned over the past 30 years is that you always treat a femoral nail with static interlocking, and you always read the femur. And, you know, any kind of blanket statement, you always step back and think, okay, let's figure out the exceptions. But these are two that you pretty much take to the bank. Um, just to give you the perspective here, and I'm going to focus more on where we've come from, uh, just so you'll know where we're going. Uh, if you look at 1939, that's really the first generation nails unlocked, unreamed by Kuncher. They were short nails. Uh, there had been some work done before this time, but Kuncher was the first one to get the concepts and the physiology right. It wasn't until the 1950s that reaming was introduced by uh, Poland Kuncher. The second generation nails came around in the 70s um, as far as how we think of closed nailing. And, and Clement Shellman worked on this uh, with permission of Kuncher, but it was really Gross and Kemp who really got this going in the Strasbourg School. Uh, and then it migrated to the United States and really kind of exploded in the United States uh, in the early 80s. Uh, in the 19, late 1990s to 2000, we started changing into this minimally invasive techniques, even more so than we had before. Uh, blocking screw technology grabbed hold, and then we started applying locking concepts to interlocking holes in these nails, and now working with computer-assisted nailing. So a lot of changes in 30 years. Um, these are the guys that really should get the credit for this, and this is Gerhard Kuncher uh, and Ernst Pohl. You never hear of Ernst Pohl. Uh, primarily because he was a Nazi and he was blacklisted uh, by the U.S. and uh, in England after the war, but he really developed uh, the first CR technology and pretty much all of Kuncher's instrumentation. Uh, and his company, uh, <coughs> which many of you all have heard of, that originally came in the late 70s when the CRMs were introduced. <coughs> the top picture on the on your uh, right is his first nail. It was actually kind of a short, uh, angular nail, kind of looked like a tent stake. 
Uh, and then in the 50s, he, he, or late 40s and 50s, he went into the cloverleaf section. There's a textbook that actually surfaced, uh, Stryker has this available, on the Merrill Nailing Method. And it was actually written by Kuncher for the U.S. Navy after World War II, but it was a classified document until just a couple of years ago. So I'd urge you all to get that and, and read that. Uh, now, this is the first uh, U.S. experience. And this is 1951, and you can look at these things and say something's wrong. Uh, the first nail has been driven through the femoral head and is in the pelvis. Uh, actually, Dr. Austin Moore did that for South Carolina. And then the one on the right is a nail that been broke uh, shortly after introduction. And because of this, there was a lot of reticence. But you have to realize that this is at a time period when the U.S. was technologically behind Germany. Uh, just to talk to you about this, after World War II, the United States had no sea arms. We had no air-conditioned ORs. We had no real metallurgical machining skills, or machining skills uh, for medical implants. We're highly influenced by the uh, British school from Hugh Owen Thomas that based was non-operative treatment. And there was a lot of confusion about the, the mirror embolization and, and what would happen. And so it pretty much killed I am nailing for the next 30 years. Uh, this is how you make a country nail if you want to make one in your shop. You take a die, take a flat piece of metal, and you crunch it down like a staple. And then you change out the die, and you make the last picture on your right that gives it the cloverleaf form. So basically, it behaves like a flat piece of metal mechanically. Uh, the, the real controversy that drove nailing is, is the three here, uh, theories of bone healing in the 1940s, still today. And, and these came from the 1700s, 1800s. Uh, Albert Collar idea was vascularity was very important to the blood supply, and that's where it all came from. Jeff Hamill was the Frenchman that came up with the idea that periosteum was the primary donor for the stem cells, you know, that we call them now. But John Goodsear was the, the group in, in, in the UK that basically said that the osteoplasts are the bone builders, and it's just a matter of getting the bone together and letting the osteoblasts heal. So if you look and trace the, you know, the development of techniques, you can see the country school really kind of uh, more was in favor of the Holler and the Hamill schools than the Goodsear school. So uh, this is a guy, Bob Winkless, with the apron, and he's showing me how to do a nail, which, you know, he, that group has taught pretty much the whole world. Um, this was his first paper in 1984, and, and I was around when Bob was giving these talks, and he would actually get ridiculed and heckled from the audience when he got up and presented this data because a 99% union rate for femur fractures was unheard of in the 1970s and 80s. Uh, and, but this was their results, and they had a really great series. And this is 1984. <laughs> I am nailing is just starting to be introduced. Uh, this is the same year, 1984, and this is from Ken Johnson, and they were using the Gross Kemp system. This is one of the first papers, and they compared it to traction device and open nailing with Sir Claus, and showed that the complication rate, failure rate, was much less with nailing. And so these two articles, in my mind, is what moved the United States and the rest of the world uh, into the I am nailing camp. Uh, if you look at the 1980s, we started seeing malunion is a big problem, implant failure was still a pretty big problem, and the implants from sticking out was still a big problem. The, uh, the nailing union rates were astounding, and that's what pretty much drove everybody to this technique. Uh, we got involved in nail design here in Memphis, because, you know, kind of a medical center and, and background, and what we really did was we looked at the mechanical characteristics of the nail and figured out a new way of making the nails. People have had closed section nails in the past. The Samson nail is a good example. Uh, Gross and Kemp experimented with country nails. But the problem was that they didn't have a manufacturing technique that they could make these nails have sufficient fatigue life and flexibility. So what we focused on was a design nail that, that had 50% of rotational stability of the femur and 90% of the bending stiff. This is it's kind of a formula. And the real advance that made this possible is a technique called gun drilling. And you guys know I'm from Tennessee, and you know, everybody in Tennessee is supposed to have a gun. Well, this is how you make gun barrels. You actually have these machines that drill out very precise cannulations in the metal. And so we just applied that technology into nailing. And this was kind of a paper we published in uh, 1988 that just showed that you could take a closed section nail and make it equivalent in, in the bending stiffness to slotted nail but your fatigue life was much higher, and that was our real ad advantage. Uh, this was a, a clinical paper from uh, shock trauma in Maryland in 1988. So this is four years later uh, when nailing is caught on, and 
the, the real concern was that if you static locked a femur, it wouldn't heal. Again, a misunderstanding of the physiology. Uh, and what uh, Brumbeck and the group at Shock Trauma showed that you could use a, a nail that was fatigue resistant uh, with a static locking mode, and even with full weight bearing, these things would heal 99% of the time. And so this really moved us into a removing the mechanical barrier to using a functional weight bearing device. Um, this is uh, go, I'm going back one, jumped over. Um, this is the, the complications of the 80s, 98. We started realizing that when we moved the nails proximally and distally, we started having more problems with our technique. Um, this is from uh, actually Bill Ritzy. He wrote this uh, when he was in training on, in Tampa with Dr. Sanders. And they found that the malalignment rate was 9% for femoral nailing. If you did proximal third fracture, it was 30%. Distal third, 10%. Unstable fracture had, had worse. But you started looking at this and figure out why is it different at these different intervals. And this is where we got involved with the surgical technique. Up to this point, the cutscher technique was taken all and break a hole into the cortex, and then with sequential reamers, just try to find the medullary canal. And the problem was, without anatomically reducing the femur, it was frequent that these reamers would actually enlarge and make a bigger hole that was oblong. And so you'd actually induce a deformity uh, by the proximal entry reamer technique. Um, this is kind of a setup problem. Uh, when we started doing nailing originally in the United States, and all of the papers from Harborview were lateral nailing. So the portal was very easy to access and easy to get to with the country technique. But in the United States, when we started doing trauma patients, we wanted to do them supine. And this technique uh, was just not as accessible with the current cutscher techniques. So if you look at these sit-ups, you know, to get the, the hip in, in the area, you really had to compress the gluteal medial abduct, um, abductor mechanisms, really squash those down to get your intraportal straight. And so frequently the table or, or just the obesity of the patient would prevent you from getting the access that you needed. Um, one of the things we've learned best about Adam Nails uh, if you look at this, uh, the picture here is that nails work best if you put them inside the bone. So if you look at this, this is one of those 1951 cases. They started the nail out here, and it totally missed the canal, and it was revised. But if you look at this trajectory, it's actually a very tight trajectory that you have to move through. Um, if you look at um, the um, issue at the top, um, this is one of the things that we're just now starting to look at, and, and that is the, the morphology. You don't use the same size nail for every patient, just like you don't use the same size total hip. And so we're starting to realize that patients with a larger, say, geriatric femur or door C type it is a different type nail requirement than one with a very small narrow canal. Um, so we started looking at entry portals. There's actually three portals that have been described now for integrated nailing. The piriformis portal, which is the one that we really recommended from Winquist. The trochanteric portal, the tip trochanteric was originally Kuncher's portal. Uh, and then now we, we talk about lateral to the tip. We talk about medial to the tip of the trochanter. Um, so these are kind of a, a continuum of access points. And then the most recent, the far lateral uh, approach. The, the far lateral is probably the most dangerous right now. From the papers that have been published, there's a high rate of iatrogenic fractures and a malalignment rate. So people are kind of gravitate more to areas around the tip of the trochanter. Uh, this is kind of why. If you go to the tip of the trochanter uh, and you look at this, then this uh, green arrow is pointing at the piriformis, which you would destroy with a piriformis nail. The gluteus medius tendon, which I can't get to move, you can see on the left side of the screen. And so this area medial of the hole is actually the hip capsule. So there's a very tight area of access. Uh, we started looking at this, and, and the idea of getting a pin precisely in point, it made it easier uh, if you were above this tendon insertion. So if you're going through the muscle instead of the tendon, you think that you do less damage. So in the paper in 2008, we, we talked about this idea of using a two-pin technique to get the, the site of the entry started right then using a solid reamer to make a straight trajectory instead of multiple flexible reamers, and then putting something in a tube to control this. 
Does it make a difference? Yeah. And if you do control this access point, you can decrease this malalignment rate to around 5%, which is pretty much within surgical error. We, in the 2000, we started moving more to these trochanteric small diameter nails. Uh, up to this point, most of the trochanteric nails were like for older patients, like the gamma nail and very large. And uh, again, Dr. Reitz and the group showed that you could move the portal uh, without significantly affecting this. And interestingly, when you moved away from the piriformis portal to these trochanteric sites, the surgical team had less radiation exposure uh, because it was more efficient, uh, and you also had decreased operative time. So portal selection and trajectory control can really help you on this. Um, the reduction maneuvers, I'm going to go over through briefly, that we use fracture tables, percutaneous reduction, uh, the, the intramedullary reducer, the, uh, the F-wrench, which really Thomas's distractor, and open reduction. And one of the points I'll make is that if you're struggling with a reduction, make a small approach, open it, get your guide wire across, and close it and go. You don't really do the patient by putting a lot of excessive traction on uh, these, these legs. So this is kind of the, the technique from the from Kuncher's error. We sit the patient up, we bend K wires or bend wires and try to move things around. Um, external fixation tools, uh, pins and pushers, these can help these fractures be reduced as well. This is uh, the technique that's really been popular the last 10 years, and that's to use a rigid, curved, accumulated structure to reduce the fracture and then pass the guide wire past it. And I think this is in large part due to some of the efficiencies we're seeing in surgery now. One of the other aspects of using reducer techniques is that you can actually get the guy wire in the exact place in the distal femur and avoid distal malalignments. Um, if you're looking at the interlocking, uh, most people right now, they're choosing uh, standard obliques for mid shafts. There are some still nail systems with transverse locking. Uh, and then there, uh, some people started advocating a reconstruction mode primarily for the idea of the misfermal neck fracture, uh, which occurs anywhere from 3 to 5% of cases. Um, distally, most people are using two screws for distal and continuity fractures and one screw for stable fractures. And if you have a very large canal infraismal of uh, blocking screws, this is one of the areas that can, can help you as well. Uh, this is probably one of the key things in the surgical technique is before you wake the patient up, you need to examine the leg for length and rotation because around the world they're still reporting a 10 to 20 percent malrotation a deformity after thermal antegrade nailing. So I think that by doing this check, you can actually uh, avoid these complications and fix them at the time of surgery. So kind of summing up, it is, I think there's been a lot of changes in the past 30 years of nailing that's brought us to the point now that we say it's the gold standard. There's a lot been done on the technical side of, of manufacturing and designing, uh, but it still requires concentration on that entry portal, the reduction and making sure your alignment and rotation are correct. Thank you.